Hello, hello. Hi, Chef Kwame Anwachi. Welcome to Forbes Ask the Expert. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having Fun. me today. Wonderful. Well, I want to get straight to it. First, I just want to introduce you so everyone knows why you're here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Klitsch, part of Forbes Lifestyle, and this is Forbes Ask the Expert, where we are welcoming experts from various industries. Today, we have Chef Kwame Anwachi. He is the founder, executive chef, and operator of Kith and Kin, which is located in D.C. Where else? What else? Um, <laughs> He's also Forbes 30 Under 30 alum and the author of Notes from a Young Black Chef, which released last year. But today he's here to talk about the local independent restaurant industry and more specifically what this means to African-American business owners and other underrepresented groups. I can't wait to get to this conversation, Chef Kwame. First, I want to ask each expert I have on Ask the Expert, how are you feeling? Before we delve into your expertise, how are you? How are you feeling? I'm okay. You know, uh, every day is different. I, I can easily stand up here and say that I'm good and I'm feeling great. But, you know, each day brings different um, level of emotions. And I think we have to be okay with that right now. This is the strangest time of our lives. We don't really know what to expect. We don't know what the future holds. So I'm taking it day by day. I'm trying to remain positive. And I'm trying to use my platform for something that's bigger than me. Yes, and that's exactly why you're here, to give those who are not in your position a voice. But first, I want to give our viewers just a timeline of what you've experienced from your eyes, what you experienced as a business owner, let's say, three, four weeks ago. Why don't you tell us what you had to do and the decisions you had to make amid this coronavirus outbreak? Yeah, um, you know, we, about four weeks ago, we had to close the restaurant down and lay off all of our employees. Um, you know, even leading up to that, it was a very scary time. You know, we, the, the amount of capacity that we had in our restaurants cut in half. We had to separate the tables. Um, and that really hurt our business. And we were leaning toward the decision of closing for the safety of the staff, our patrons. Um, but ultimately, we had to close and um, lay off our employees. And it was it was the hardest day of my life as a business owner, telling people they weren't gonna come back and not knowing um, how they would be able to provide for themselves during this tough time. Yes, can you give us a picture of how many restaurants do you own and how many people work for you? One, uh, and there's about 65 people at the restaurant. Great. Yeah, we're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. So it's a pretty, pretty busy restaurant. It takes a lot of people to, to operate. Right. Um, so after having to close down, you teamed up with other chefs in the industry. Tell us about the Independent Restaurant Coalition, what you're doing, what are they fighting for? So the Independent Restaurant Coalition was formed to be a voice for the independent restaurants around the nation. When I say independent restaurants, that's everywhere from a small little mom and pop shop, you know, to a restaurant like mine that employs 65 people. And um, we wanted to get representation in the CARES Act. You know, the CARES Act uh, provides, a, it's a stimulus package for small businesses, um, but we needed to be carved out within that. You know, we employ over 11 million people in this nation, the food and beverage industry. We uh, equate uh, uh, almost a trillion dollars into the economy and we deserve to be thought of and we deserve a unique um, lane within that uh, CARES Act so that we can still be here when this is all said and done. Where does the CARES Act fall short? And I read that you and your team put together a letter, sent it to Washington. What's in it? Um, so it falls short within the PPP. There are flaws within the PPP, whether it's uh, the, the loan forgiveness, uh, the qualifications uh, uh, that a business has to have in order to even qualify for this. Um, we're also looking for um, the, the insurance companies to take care of us with the frame. We're also looking for a restaurant stabilization fund. You know, it, it takes a lot to get back on our feet. You know, I think as a restaurant operator, I know the razor thin margin that goes into it, but I also know the the hands that are also fed from a restaurant. 60% of our profits 
go back into our local economy. Now that's small wine producers, that's small purveyors, um, that's linen companies, you know, ice making companies. There's certain people that are affected by the closure of restaurants and we need to be properly represented with, um, you know, just proper representation within that CARES Act. Great, you know, when I first started following what was going on in the restaurant industry due to the mandated closures. I first spoke with one of your peers, Chef Tom Colicchio, and he mm -hmm. said there are just so many intricacies to the restaurant industry that DC does not understand. Could you just list some of those that you're trying to communicate through um, lobbyists and other advocates on the Hill? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just the things that I, that I listed. It's direct um, changes within the PPP, you know, the, the loan repayment from two years to 10 years. You know, if, if we don't get complete loans, there's no way we can pay back these funds within two years. Um, you know, we're looking for, um, we're, we're looking for people to understand this isn't just a restaurant problem. You know, this is a national problem. People go to restaurants to uh, celebrate. They go there to be lifted up when they're mourning. You know, they go there for business meetings, um, restaurants, bars, things like that. There are, um, they're gathering places. And we just need representation within that. And that's fixing the flaws within the PPP. And also um, uh, certain tax rebates that we should be eligible for because we employ people throughout crisis. And we have the most smallest margins within any business. Um, and we should have tax incentives for that. Understood. For those who are just joining us, again, this is Chef Kwame Anwachi on Ask the Expert. He's here to talk about what to do to save the restaurant industry from collapse, as well as giving a voice to underrepresented business owners and minority groups who are especially affected by COVID-19. And I want to encourage all our viewers, those joining in, to drop a question in the comments section. Our social media team is uh, fielding all our questions to make sure Kwame can answer them. Um, before we get to them, um, I also would love to ask you, um, I remember just about two weeks ago, the IRC had a press call where your other peer, another chef, Naomi Pomeroy, uh, mentioned that People like you, David Chang, Naomi, and Tom, you're not just trying to protect your own business, but you're also giving a voice to the inaudible. Can you tell us more about that, especially from your experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's a, a vast uh, community of underrepresented people, you know, minorities that have come come up within this industry, you know, women, people of color. And it's already been tough up until this time frame. Um, and right now we, we need help. We need help so we can get through this pandemic. And that's what, you know, the chefs that you've just mentioned and myself are using our platform for, to speak for these people. What kind of tips and words of encouragement do you have to minority-owned business owners as well as African-American um, non-essential workers? I mean, I would say, you know, you need to go to your banks. You need to talk with your lenders. You need to try to see what you can procure out of this CARES Act. But, you know, most importantly, you need to be taking care of yourself during this time frame. I think you know, we've worked really, really hard. Um, there's not a time when we do get a break to kind of back um, and assess the challenges that we've had in life or where life is taking us or where we're going. So um, I think that this is a time to really self-reflect and um, take care of yourself during this time frame. Okay, I'm just gonna start asking questions from our viewers. First up is, uh, Kwame, how do you see the restaurant industry changing after society more or less returns to normal? It's going to change substantially. You know, I don't think people are going to be running back into restaurants. And I, I also believe that there's going to be mandates for um, restaurants to operate at a lower level of capacity, just so that we're not all crammed in this tight space. But I feel like restaurants are going to have to go to single use uh, menus, you know, sealed silverware the servers wearing gloves or face masks, um, signs saying that we're sanitizing, 
down the eating surfaces uh, before and after people um, dine with us. So it's going to be more costly to operate a restaurant. And, you know, we really have to take into consideration moving forward. Okay, next question is, in your opinion, is the government doing enough or are they missing the mark so far? They are missing the mark because they need to listen to the people that actually operate these businesses, you know, and that's why the IRC was formulated so that we can be that voice. You know, we need more than bigger um, corporations being present uh, within these conversations with the administration. So we need to represent all the constituents. We need to represent everyone from small mom and pop shops, you know, that have spent their life savings on this American dream, um, you know, to the larger restaurants. And that's what we're here for. Kwame, speaking of the American dream, our viewers want to know your story. How did you start in the restaurant industry? And what was your primary inspiration? I started in the industry for my mom. She's a chef and a caterer, and she started a catering company from the house. And fortunate, fortunately for me, you know, very much against the law, I became her first employee, and I was five years old. And that's how I really got into cooking. Um, and from there, I got kind of chore that developed into a passion and went all the way. I started my own catering company, and then eventually opened up my own restaurants. And um, that's how I got to where I'm at today. Kwame, can you also tell us more about what it was like being a young African-American in the fine dining industry and just how you were able to climb the ranks in such a competitive field? It was tough. You know, I was the only person of color in most of these kitchens. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, negative isms that get um, masked behind the bravado of like hazing or like you know, starting from the bottom within and climbing your way to the ranks. And it's not for everybody, you know, I definitely went through a lot. It, it made me stronger, it made me who I am today. Um, but, you know, restaurants are as absolved from uh, racism as they are sexism. And it, it wasn't an easy road. Do you think that due to coronavirus and its catastrophic effects on the restaurant industry and society as a whole will begin to make the restaurant and fine dining industry more inclusive, um, with more equality, as groups like the IRC have banded together, together to show that there can be unity within the whole sector? I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. I think, you know, the powers that be, the, the people with money, the people that invest should diversify their investments, you know, and I think it starts at the top, you know, it starts with editorial magazines, getting editors and chiefs of, of color or women, and, and then it trickles down from there. So um, we need a lot, you know, I don't think anything is going to be wiped out overnight. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, what the answer is, is to that question. I think, you know, marginalized people to dig deep now and, you know, see that you should be taking care of yourself in this moment and just pushing through like we've always done for hundreds of years. Next question from our viewers. Um, do you have any advice for someone who wants to start their own business, food related or not? Don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid to fall down. You know, failures can be some of your biggest points of success to when you, that light bulb, uh, that was off in your head of what you need to do to better yourself. So do not be afraid to fail. I don't care if you're making jump ropes or you're making, you know, um, quality food. Um, do not be afraid of failure. Okay. Do you believe underrepresented businesses? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you believe underrepresented business owners are being more impacted by the shutdowns? I think everyone's being impacted by the shutdowns. I think underrepresented people are being um, uh, are being more affected by the virus in general. So I think if you look at it like that, yes, we are. But I think everyone's being affected by this, all industries, and um, we're in this together. You know, we just got to get through this tough, tough point. 
Um, during the press call that the IRC held two weeks ago, where you, Tom and Naomi spoke, um, you voiced more opinions and how um, disappointed you were on how inequality was really playing out as a result of COVID. Can you tell us more about it and your concerns? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the numbers and the statistics, you know, there are more people, m more minorities dying of this virus than, than others. And if you look at, you know, the Bronx, for example, if you were to get coronavirus, you're three times more likely to perish than your neighbors across the river in Manhattan. Um, so those statistics, those numbers are real. And it's an unfortunate reality. And, uh, lens into the disparity in this country, whether it's, you know, healthcare disparities or just a concentration of um, uh, efforts to saving our Americans. They, it's, it's vastly unrepresented and it's also vastly transparent at this time. Right. And um, how can people support their favorite establishments beyond simply ordering takeout and delivery? Can we support the local restaurant community? I think there's a lot of restaurants doing GoFundMes for their staff, the virtual tipping. Um, you can also order from these restaurants, buy gift cards for the future. Um, there are many ways to support or, you know, just when we reopen, I think the best way is just to come out and eat, you know, and, uh, support these businesses as soon as we open back up. So you've since had to lay off so many workers over the past few weeks um, as a result of closures. How are you staying connected with your team? Um, what, how do you lead a business right now that can operate? Well, you try to be a leader in this time frame, you know, and communicate. So I call some of the employees, we text, you know, we DM each other, try to lift each other up. Um, but um, to get through this. So just being that support system, whether it's just a simple, hey, just to check, on, check in on them is, is really, really important during this time. So, so they know that they're not alone. Yes, you mentioned um, what it's like in the Bronx right now. Can you tell us more about your upbringing in New York and just what the food industry, the restaurant industry, how it saved you from your upbringings um, as much as you were raised by a loving mother, a gifted chef herself, but you were also, um, you know, grew up in a very difficult neighborhood and just how your career path helped you rise from that and how you hope for this um, to also save other people employed by the industry. Yeah, you know, I grew up in the Bronx and the South Bronx and it was definitely a rough a rough upbringing. It was very easy to veer off on the wrong path. Luckily for me, my mother sent me to Africa to really understand what I have here and what I need to appreciate. And even the small things like running water and electricity, you know, we live in a way that most of the world does not live and we need to really, really understand that. Uh, so I think my perseverance and my, um, my ability to keep pushing forward, my mental dexterity, it, it just came from my surroundings and knowing where I could go and knowing that where I was was not my final destination. You know, where I started wasn't my final destination and I just kept pushing through. But um, there are, you know, there are real um, adversities uh, within my community for growth. You know, there's a lack of um, access to capital, you know, that minorities face, um, that other groups of people don't, you know, there's, um, a, a, just, a, a there, there's, there wasn't many examples for success stories, um, growing up for me. And I had to dig deep within myself and continue to push forward. Before you turned 30, you actually had enough experience to open what five restaurants before the big three O. So, how much do you try to hire for diversity in order to empower the next generation of people who come from your background? I think for me, diverse people just gravitate towards, towards me because they see themselves in me. So they can work under me and say like, oh, I can be that one day, you know? So um, 
my staff is highly diverse. Um, we have all walks of life in the restaurant. It, it's a beautiful thing. And, and that also reflects to my patrons. I have all walks of life that come in and eat at the restaurant. And it's a place where they feel safe, where they feel like home. Wonderful. And that's something that you really write about in your book, Notes from a Young Black Chef. It's really not just about coming up in the restaurant industry. It's really a motivational book for anyone who wants to um, overcome adversity and make it in any field. So I really recommend it. Thank you. Um, another question. What is one of your favorite dishes that you like to make at your restaurant? Um, the curried goat with dal pori roti. It's a Trinidadian dish. My um, grandfather is from Trinidad. So it's one of my first food memories. Really, really good. It has a lot of levels of complexity. So uh, yeah, a Trini dish is probably the favorite thing that I, that I have at the restaurant. Wonderful. And many of us are stuck at home, cooking, missing our favorite beloved eateries. Can you just give us a very quick <laughs> recipe that anyone can whip up here at home? Oh man, a quick recipe that anyone can whip up at home, uh, seared steak, seared steak or just really delicious charred vegetables, you know, get a cast iron pan and season your vegetables, whatever spice you want and char them and eat them with a, with the steak or eat them as is. It's really, really great. Wonderful. Thank you, Kwame. And can you just remind the audience once more the main message that you and your peers at the Independent Restaurant Coalition want to drive home amid this coronavirus outbreak? Yeah, I mean, you know, speak, speak up on the things that you want um, because restaurants, you know, they're, they're the lifeline of, of the nation and they are where we go to live more importantly, you know, and we really need to make sure that they're here when it's all said and done. You can go to saverestaurants.com and sign up, uh, put a signature on our letter to Congress so that our voice and our voice is your voice can be heard. Kwame, I want to thank you for taking time to join Forbes Ask the Expert today. Um, we're going to continue following the IRC and what else is being done in D.C. to save the restaurant industry from collapse. Um, thank you so much. And any last words to our audience? Um, stay positive during this time. It's really easy to get stuck in the monotony of getting up and doing the same thing over and over again, but just have one goal a day. It can be anything. It can be even make a cookie recipe. Just uh, focus on one thing um, per day and we'll all get through this together. <laughs>